personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Greetings and welcome to the Resistance Library podcast. I am your host, Sam Jacobs. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Congressman Dr. Paul Gosar. He is one of the, in my opinion, best members of the United States Congress. He represents the 4th District of Arizona. uh, And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me on. So this is a pretty vague question to start with, but I think it's a really good place to start. Um, how bad are things under the Biden regime? How bad are they going to get? And kind of what's the path out of the darkness? Well, I will tell you, they're as bad or worse than what we would have imagined uh, under this administration. You've seen this president double down on all the different aspects of trying to eradicate President Trump's accomplishments from the executive order plethora that have demagogued us, uh, and took us from energy de- independence to now uh, a, b- a back burner, you know, where we see escalating prices at the fuel tank to get our fuel tanks filled up and uh, 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 being dependent upon other countries. It's pretty sad. You see an immigration out of con- system in crisis, out of control in our southern border in Arizona. They're just pouring across. There's no there's no enforcement of the law. And now it's incumbent upon the states to have to do that. You see seeing that with Texas now going to uh, start building the wall and they're incarcerating individuals based on trespassing and and uh, uh, other aspects that are state controlled. Um, You're seeing spending that's out of control. I mean, spending that we have money that we don't have. And you're also seeing that the fact that the, the market is now flooded with money. Uh, we're seeing inflation going up. That's the new tax that people are, are, are finally getting wise to. You know, if you've gone to Home Depot to buy a two by four, the cost is just skyrocketing. Um, and uh, we're seeing our foreign affairs, um, our adversaries like China and Russia, saber rattling. And then you see what this administration has done overseas. They're the laughing stock where we can't even get our, our countries right, whether it be Syria or Libya. And then in the Second Amendment aspects, you have an ATF director who actually is coming after our guns. He literally is going after the, the guns. They, what they really, really want is to limit you on what weapons you can have and the number and quantity of ammo that you have for those, those, uh, those firearms. It's a sad state of affairs. Um, and Last but not least, we're seeing a redefinition of our educational system with critical race theory and cancel culture. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's bad when you're seeing parents now having to take to the school boards to address uh, the inadequacies of the schools, if they're even open, based upon the fallacies of this administration and the schools. So it's, it's, it, I could go on and on, Sam, but it's worse than I've ever imagined. And this is just 120 some days into this presidency. So, to, but to get to the second part of the question, because I think that this is really important, because I think that it it's crucial that people not just kind of get super black pilled about this and go, oh well, it's all you know, it's all all is lost. What's our way out? How do we move through this and move back to a country where people feel secure in their freedom? Well, we, I always go back, Sam, to the, to the comment made that when there's greatest disarray is the greatest opportunity for change. And so that's the opportunity that we find ourselves. They're at their weakest point when they're trying to expand so ra- rapidly. So we have to fight. We have to come back and, and engage the American public. We have to show them what we stand for. What, what are some of the ideas? You know, energy independence. Now we're sh- sh- showing that People like Michael Moore now are on our side, basically saying you got to use fossil fuels if you're talking about climate change, because the green energy doesn't work for baseload power. And so there are there are shining lights out there. Now what we have to do is we have to forecast that in an organized fashion so that the American public doesn't lose heart. We also have to make sure that we get 
get get the the public the information that they so needed. Like for example, you know, most of us believe that the the election was flawed one way or the other. Well, why not get get go back in like we've espoused to having that forensic audit to count ballots by hand to make sure that it's either right or wrong. Hold those accountable if it was wrong and and make changes or accept the results and say, hey, we get, it, it, the election was done great. We have to start talking with America. I think that's the biggest key. The answers don't come from Washington, D.C. They come from America. Yeah, and I, I, wa- I just want to take the opportunity to remind people to call your state legislators and demand an audit in your state. Uh, people tend to get very, very fixated on federal elections over state elections. Your state government has not only a lot of power, but is much more responsive to you because the elections are decided by much smaller margins. And so please do pick up the phone and call your congressman, uh, your sorry, your state legislator uh, and demand an audit and election integrity going forward. Um, well, and, and to that point, Sam, I think that you're, you make a great point. The way out is is the Tenth Amendment, the sovereignty of the states. But we have to have states that are willing to stand up against the overreach of the federal government. Like currently, right now, that audit in Arizona is being threatened by the uh, Biden administration's DOJ. Now we have to have a, an attorney general like Mike, Mark Burnovich, who's ready to say, "Don't come into my state and try to tell me about elections that are controlled by the state. That's overreach. Get the hell out of Arizona." So you know, call your state legislators implore them to continue forward, to have a stiff backbone, to, to stay the course, and also support those that stand up like Mark Brnovich, the attorney general, making a stand against the federal government and its overreach. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about the leadership changes that took place in the Republican Party in the Congress uh, about a month ago with the replacement of Liz Cheney. Uh, is this a step in the right direction? Is this just kind of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Uh, How do we ensure that we're being represented by our elected representatives who at least ostensibly have a pro-freedom, pro-American way of life uh, viewpoint and philosophy? Well, I think that the ouster of Ms. Cheney was appropriate. And the reason I say that is, is because Rick Cheney allowed her hatred for Donald Trump uh, supersede her love for this country. That is clearly what transpired here. Because nobody in their right mind wants Joe Biden and the administration that we currently have. That's just it's not plausible. So um, I will tell you, there may be some division in regards to that, but the resolve of the Republican Party in regards to anti-administration of the Biden, they're 110% behind it. It's how do we go about dismantling it? How do we stop the, 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 the wound from continuing to bleed? Uh, these executive orders, this overreach, and how do we get back to empowering Americans to be the solution, not uh, not uh, imp- uh, victims of the of the crime, or indeed viewed as the enemy by the administration? Oh, absolutely, and you know we got to we got to put a stop to the socialist push that we're seeing this administration go full full bore with, uh, double barreled. They're going right at it, you know, trying to pursue this this very liberal agenda pushing us further down the socialist ladder and and into communism. I I agree. And I also think that that's kind of, you know, that's my silver lining is that, uh, you know, there, my father is a, uh, is a, is a big union Democrat, which, you know, is not the same. And he, and when I say union, I mean one that actually does work, not one that sits behind a desk and shuffles tickets Mm -hmm. around all day. Uh, And even he's saying like, it's go, it's go, it's going too far for him. And he's voted for two Republicans in his life, Richard Nixon and Scott Brown. Um, so I, I think this is kind of the silver lining I take away from it is how far, how fast they've pushed. Uh, and if you look historically, you know, this almost always results in a huge backlash where there's any kind of, you know, meaning, meaningful Democratic participation in the, in the country. Well, I, I agree. I agree with you, Sam. The thing that I really want to see is. This is a golden opportunity for us to set the example. What do we stand for? This We ought to be engaging America to say, listen, what is the America that you want to see your children and your grandchildren having? Going on a listening tour instead of a talking tour. And and, and because I, I'm a believer as a, as a in my previous life being a dentist, you have to talk to the patient. You have to talk to the constituent because they know what the problem is and they know how to solve it if you're just quiet long enough. 
you have to engage them. And when you engage them, you're empowering them to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And, uh, you know, I, I get warm welcomes in regards to that because uh, empowerment is much better than victimization. And the Democrats are playing the victim card over and over and over again. And, and humanity doesn't like that. They don't like being dependent. They want to be a source of their own independence. But the power of freedom is incredible. Uh, and we just need to trust it and engage it. Um, I want to bring the subject over to immigration and specifically the I don't know that I, I don't think that invasion is a hyperbolic uh, means of describing what is going on at our southern border right now. Um, we recently got news that there's cartel activity taking place in the United States. Uh, how bad is it going to get and what should people prepare themselves for? And as usual, like, what do we do about it? Well, I mean, the, the die has been cast with this administration lawlessness. There's there's no there's no equal application of the law. So that's where we can start from. And that if you're a Republican or a conservative, you're going to get you're going to get doxxed by by the, the uh, Department of Justice and this administration. With that being said, the, the 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 amount of people pouring over our border is not been stated properly. Now, in May alone, over 180,000 people were apprehended. Let's, we haven't talked about those that haven't been apprehended. And at very best, they'll tell you from Border Patrol, they may catch one out of every two. So think about that. If it's one out of every two, that means there was 360,000 people coming across the border in one month. We've ceded the operational control of the border to the cartels. People do not cross the border without the cartel's permission or knowledge. Of. That's how bad it is. They've intercepted more fentanyl uh, in the first four months than they did this year than they did of all of last year. It's, it's horrendous. And we see this pandemic of opioids uh, with fentanyl. Fentanyl doesn't give you an opportunity uh, for a second chance. Just a little overdose will kill you. And that's not even talking about the human suffering in regards to the human trafficking. We're complicit in that, where we're taking children away from their, uh, from their families. Most of these children are actually extorted from families. And it's sad that we're, we're allowing that to occur. Um, you even had condemnations from uh, the Mexican president, the Guatemalan uh, 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 interview or uh, visit by Kamala Harris. It was a joke. But this is all about the power play. What the Democrats feel is that these illegal immigrants that are coming into this country illegally, uh, they're the future Democratic voter. Uh, I would caution them. You know, the recent uh, Supreme Court rulings that were 9-0 basically said that if you came in illegally, you don't get to stay here legally or get in line to, for a green card. So I think there's some good uh, possibilities here. The problem is, is that this administration is showing a deaf, deaf ear and eye to the problem. Uh, it's been 80 some days since Kamala Harris was appointed the czar of, of immigration. And uh, it's sad that she's not even paid a visit to the men and women that are serving us on the border, putting their lives at risk and trying to at least make some sense of uh, immigration policy. Uh, but now it's now it's going to be up to the states, particularly in the southern border, whether it be Texas or Arizona. Uh, you can't count on much from New Mexico or California. But, you know, there is hope there is hope that at least half of them can start that process. Of course, closely related to the topic of immigration is the topic of amnesty uh, for the illegals that are currently in the country. The number that's generally floated is 10 million. I believe it's probably closer to 30. Um, but, you know, who am I? Uh, I would love to know where is that? Where is the push for amnesty at? And is there any way back from that if there is a mass amnesty? There, 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 there is. There's, there is a push, and it goes all the way around. Uh, Sam, you know, I've actually portrayed, you know, some of this, uh, some of the problems with our immigration system, and uh, I think part of that is, is like big tech. People don't realize that the government gives big tech this opportunity called the OPT, the Optional Practical Training Program. And what it does is it incentivizes them to bring in foreign workers from uh, places like Pakistan, India, and China at much reduced rates. And then they get a 15.5% discount by hiring them. And that's part of the FICA withholding taxes. 
yet these individuals will still be will be eligible for the uh, Social Security and, and uh, Medicare, which are what those FICA taxes pay for. So it's like a double dipping. Now, now you're starting to see Medicare insolvency by 2024 and Social Security by 2030. So now we're waking up another part of the segment of the population to say, oh, something that I put into all my life, I might not get something out of. That is a real interesting application. But we have to hold people like the big tech companies accountable for that aspect. Second of all, you have to look at now the declaration like in Texas, where now they're incarcerating people for violating like trespassing, which they can actually uh, hold and, and, and uh, force the hand of the, the federal government for deportation. So I, I think there's opportunities that abound here. It's just that we have to be creative. But we also have to have people that stand up for the rule of law and say, nope, nope, nope. And I think that there'll be a big push for amnesty next year with DACA. I want to remind your listeners that DACA is an illegal program. Um, it violated the Anti-Deficiency Act, which requires Congress to uh, fund it specifically and for Congress to have uh, actually legislated. That's why the OPT uh, program is no, not legal as well, because it, it never went through Congress. It's an act of the Department of Homeland Security under the last years of the George Bush administration. And so uh, I, I don't see the votes being there, but, you know, the, the plea goes on and on and on. But they're, they're overdoing their welcome when you're allowing 180,000 people into this country uh, with catch and release every month. Uh, that just is overwhelming the system. And particularly coming after COVID, where the rules of engagement are are, not, are much more different for an illegal immigrant that we're welcoming versus a citizen that we're hampering, we're uh, quarantining them, keeping their kids out of school, uh, and delaying opening up society. So uh, I I think there's good good pause, but once again, I would hold Republicans' feet to the fire not to fall for that 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 that, that Ponzi scheme. Um, but we also have to come up with ideas like I just proposed with OPT, holding people accountable for violations of, of the rule of law. The program doesn't exist legally because Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution only gives Congress the power of immigration, not the executive branch, not, not Homeland Security. Um, so we have to fight back. We have to have people that are staunch, hold the line, have a backbone and, and call it for what it is over and over and over and over again. You know, they say the squeaky wheel always gets the oil, and that's the way we have to be. And when you talk about holding big tech accountable, what what specifically would that look like? Well, I, I'm, I've got some different ideas, Sam. So one of the things I've looked at is I want mar marketplaces. I and mean, we don't have an active marketplace because the, the up and coming techs, which some of them are very conservative and supportive, have a hard time without having some of the exclusions like Section 230. So I've looked at big tech, number one, as uh, how do we look at 230 and get it back in, in order? Well, as a private business, yes, all of them deal with contracts. Well, maybe what we ought to have is every person that subscribes to them is offered the filter that they want in their subscription to, to those platforms. So if I choose a platform where I don't want to see any uh, uh, racial biases, that is imparted. And if, if they violate that, I can have the ability to sue. If I want clean, open access to the internet, then when they censor anything, I have the ability to sue. That way we use trial attorneys and the big trial uh, uh, caucus to actually hold big tech in check. And what I found here in this uh, uh, place called DC, when you put two big groups opposing each other, Usually the American public wins. So I think that Section 230 needs to be modified. It doesn't need to go all the way away because what will end up happening, it'll hamper the competition in that marketplace. But second of all, Democrats have looked at using antitrust laws, lawsuits to break them up because they're monopolies. I'm responsible for taking away that exemption for the medical insurance industry uh, in the last Congress, where they had collusive, uh, okay, behavior of collusion um, and monopolies, and the same thing can happen here. But what I would caution everybody is, is just by breaking up the uh, big techs uh, by using the antitrust, either vertically or and or horizontally, you're just taking the five big sharks 
uh, and turning them into a school of prana. They're just going to eat you. It's just a different bite size. And we're making them smaller, but more vicious um, unless you change section 230. So those conversations are going on. Uh, like I said, the antitrust uh, a- application, uh, Democrats are looking at more uh, more intensively. Uh, and I'll take it if, if that's all I can get. But I think it's very, very wise to have an option on the table that allows for contracts so that the customer is in charge, not the platform. Yeah, and uh, about Section 230, I mean, I think the issue is less that we need to get rid of it than that we need to enforce it. You know, it's not being enforced, to the best of my knowledge, because the Twitter and Facebook are acting as editorial platforms. You know, well, I mean, they, that, they, you're exactly right, because they were never intended to be the, a, a platform in the, the public square, but they are. But once again, it gives you the credibility that the DOJ does not hold equal application of that of the law. In fact, they they utilized it. Christopher Ray has been noted in regards to last year's involvement and what was acceptable in the political uh, theater and what was and what was not. And so uh, we got to get government out of that and making sure that the, that it's customer customer based and not uh, uh, federal government uh, censorship friendly. Switching gears again, I want to talk about energy. And specifically the power grid, which is like the thing that that's the thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night is the power grid, especially when we're getting news that there's constant cyber attacks against the power grid, uh, that these are these are a regular occurrence. Of course, we found out about the fragility of the power grid when when significant portions of it are moved onto so-called green energy, uh, which, in my opinion, is just a massive government boondoggle. I don't know that any of these green energy companies would exist if it weren't for government subsidies. Um, But, you know, how vulnerable is is the American power grid? And other than, you know, prepping, which I always encourage people to do in moderate and sensible ways, have a couple of months of food around. Uh, own a generator, that kind of thing. Uh, what can we do to ensure the security of our power grid? Because I mean, the way that I always kind of frame it is, I'm not worried about the world going road warrior next week. Uh, but I think that, you know, the power grid going down for two weeks uh, in the Western third of the United States or something, as a, just as a for instance, um, I think is much more likely and much more the thing that people should be concerned about, especially when, you know, we, we hear about these cyber attacks. Of course, there was the colonial pipeline um, attack, which the, you know, the, Bi- the Bi- Biden regime had absolutely no, um, no coherent response to, you know, so what, how, what is the threat level and what can citizens re- realistically expect their elected officials to do about it? Well, it's a fabulous question because you don't do anything without energy. Uh, you, you know, the way of life in the United States ceases to exist when you don't have reliable power. And that's the first the first step is, is that I'm one of those people that believes in all the above energy policies. Uh, you know, there's a place for solar, uh, particularly like in my state. Um, but like you said, it's got to be subsidy free. Um, but there's also a place because that's an intermittent energy. It's only when the sun is shining that you get that energy. When it's dark, you have to have something more baseload like gas, coal, nuclear. And diversification is a big factor for what, what we do with a grid. The grid is just like the banking world. It's being attacked over and over and over and over and over again. And so we have to make sure that our resources are, are, are getting into those, the right spots. So that we, we talk to our children about going into the STEM fields, you know, the engineering, the math, uh, the sciences, the, and, and computer science. Th- these are all parts that that uh, we want good American citizens to be able to hold and be challenged. So it's sad to, uh, for me when I, I basically tell you that one half of our STEM graduates with degrees in STEM are ac- actually occupied in the STEM field. That's sad. That's, those are not numbers that are we should be proud of. We should be about America first, hiring those uh, students that come out of our universities that are citizens of this country before we do somebody from over across the seas that may not have the same uh, uh, faith or or adherence 
to our way of life um, and to uh, the, the, the prospect of, of this country, uh, allegiance to this country. So it is very uh, concerning to me, and that's why I've been a push for all the above energy uh, in, in, in enabling us to be geopolitically uh, more advanced in the world because we have the cleanest energy. We have the, uh, the best way of recovering. We have the most best environmental laws, and we have the best labor laws. I mean, you look at what China does with some of these critical minerals and stuff like that. They use child labor. Uh, you, you can't you can't have it both ways. You have to be self reliant, and I think that the more that we're reliant on others, the more vulnerable our our society becomes, and the and the uh, uh, the delivery of energy is a big part of that. How do we ensure that we're electing the right kind of Republicans in 2022 and 2024? I mean, to, to, to me, and I think a lot of my listeners, you know, the right kind of Republican looks a lot like you or uh, Lauren Boebert or somebody like that, you know, and, and I think that there really is a, a thirst and a hunger on the part of the, not only just the, what they would call the Republican base, but I think on the part of the average uh, American to get people who are more responsive, uh, more representative of the needs of the average American than, you know, uh, Exxon Mobil or what have you. You know, I think that the I, to its credit, I think that the Republican Party has shifted uh, dramatically away from being a party of Wall Street to a party of Main Street. And I applaud that. But how do we uh, continue that trajectory in 2022, ensuring that we, we have that kind of representation in the Congress? Well, I think I think it gets back to that contract with America, Sam. I don't know that it's a, like the, like the New Gingrich contract with America. I think it's a little different. I think it's the principles of freedom, recapturing America through the eyes of, of Americans. That's where you empower somebody when you ask them the, what's the problem and what's the solution to engage them. I think they, that was the power and, and the, the brilliance of uh, Donald Trump is that the everyday people said, listen, I was thinking that, and that man just said it. You know, he can't be bought. Obviously, he couldn't be bought. He was a junkyard dog. He came from New York City, so he actually had a spine and would stand for something. So that's why I think the, the, the America First agenda is so important. And I also I will tell you is, is that when you see the Democrats get so riled up about a concept, you know you're over the target, and you need to keep staying there and sticking on that message. Why is it that they attack America first? Well, because they want America last. They want it to be dependent upon everybody else in the world and, and put America second to everybody as well. So I think the engagement is now is, is more about instead of chapping our, slapping our lips and telling us, you know, this is what I'm doing, do, do, do. This are, these are some of the things I have on my agenda. What ideas do you have? as a constituent, as a citizen, to keep you up at night? And what's the solution that you have? And start engaging. Make that comparison. This is a golden opportunity, as I said. It's a weak point uh, for the Democrats because they've overreached. Why not telling, uh, telling people, this is what we would do when, when we get into power? And, and trust is a series of promises kept, Sam. And, and we, we, we don't get second chances anymore. So when we had the, the, the majority under Ryan and, and Trump and, and McConnell, that was a waste of time. It, we got some things done, but think of how much more we could have gotten done. Think of what Donald Trump got done on his own, even under the scrutiny of four, uh, four years under, or basically five years, uh, of, the, of the press and, and the Democrats. People are, willing to, are much more willing to listen to an upbeat message than a downtrodden message. So I think that's the biggest key. And, and I will tell you is get out and talk to the people running. Ask them, give me examples of how, what you stand for and where you took a stand. Show me what, how you supported something and got it through. Tell me that I can trust you. Hold my feet to the fire, just like every other member of Congress. I ask that over and over again. And then ask for a report card. The last time I looked, the government is you, the people, we the people. And we need to address you, not the other way around. So we need to, to be answering that. But we have to do our due diligence in looking at the backgrounds of these people that are running for U.S. Senate, for Congress, for our state legislatures, statewide, like our uh, 
We see how important election integrity is. So our secretaries of state, our attorney generals, and our governors. Look at what Ron DeSantis has done in, in Florida. There's an example of somebody standing up and saying, listen, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Thought I could. Thought I could. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. That little engine that could. It's, it's not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do if you put your mind to it. Congressman Dr. Paul Gosar, once again, I want to thank you for your time and for appearing on the Resistance Library podcast. Once again, the Resistance Library podcast is brought to you by Ammo.com. You can get $20 off any order of $200 or more by going to Ammo.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's Ammo.com forward slash podcast. Uh, I would remind people that in these times, we tend to go through ammunition very, very quickly. So if we do not have the caliber or the amount that you're looking for, uh, I would urge you to just come back in a couple days check our stock again. But again, that link is ammo.com forward slash podcast. I am Sam Jacobs, and we will see you next time on the Resistance Library Podcast. Thanks. Thanks.